we've seen that you have filed a nolly prosecute um, for 30 youths and that we also know in May the Amnesty International came and met the president. One of their recommendations was for the anti-crime unit to desist from arbitrary ar arrest. Um, we are now in, in September. Um, you are filing nolly prosecute for 30 people who have been held in mile two for 14 days. But yet still, there are seven others who are still charged. Um, what's the logic behind maintaining the charge on the seven? And most importantly, will there be steps taken to address the anti-crime unit, especially considering the recommendation from Amnesty International, sir? Well, thank you. I mean, there are parts of that question which are mine and parts which are not. The, what the anti-crime unit does is the responsibility of the police and the interior ministry. Um, however, as the government, uh, as the Honorable Minister of Information said, there is a security sector reform ongoing. We do not expect um, all habits to die quickly. It takes some time. But I think one thing you will all accept as well is that there have been improvements in the way that the police are dealing with ordinary Gambians um, compared to the past. We can't deny that. Now, there will be occasional excesses. Um, there's no doubt about that. I will be hard pressed to point out any country in this world, including the most advanced democracies, where um, there are no police excesses um, occasionally. So. Um, the challenge for us really is to try to prevent it from happening and that when it happens occasionally, we address them. And I think that was the spirit in which um, Amnesty International submitted their report. And allow me to say as well that I had engaged Amnesty International on that report and we came to a mutual understanding that um, the report was not meant to be conveyed in the way that it came out. So they admitted to some extent that um, the report could have been better um, conveyed. Mm? Uh, it was written communications between us because we were going to, because we conducted our investigations um, following that report and we were able to establish that actually not everything in that report was 100% accurate. And so instead of coming out with a statement to counter amnesty in public because of our collaborative um, work, we reached out to them and pointed those out to them. And they admitted that as well. So just to share that with you, that not everything you read from some international organizations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, they are as fallible as we are um, in government. There's no doubt about that. In terms of um, why I discontinued the prosecution of Tati and retain seven. Well, we have to understand how our criminal justice process works in this country. The police have a duty. They have a, an obligation to um, fight crime. Um, that means preventing it or investigating it after it occurs. Uh, in the course of their investigations, if they have reason to believe that a particular suspect um, has been involved in a crime, then they will conduct their arrest um, based on preliminary investigations and then um, because of the 72-hour requirement, um, they would um, take them to court. I think we all know that we are trying very hard to make sure that everyone who is arrested in this country is brought before a court within the 72 hours. I think that is credit as well to this new government, unlike the past. Now, the reason why we do that is because the police cannot complete their investigations within a 72-hour period. And if the passing is a flight risk, and the police will take them before a court of law and request for them to be remanded in custody while they continue their investigations. At the conclusion of those investigations, the case file is sent here to the ministry for our review and advice as to whether there is sufficient evidence to proceed with the case in court. Now, while um, in this particular occasion, because of the public interest in the matter and the number of, the, um, uh, number of youths who were arrested, um, it was out of um, collective concern that I didn't even wait for the police to conduct their investigations completely or send the file here. I reached out to the police and I said, um, the number is too high, um, 37. This, we, we have to keep remembering something. This country is still not 
as, as, as stable or as um, perhaps entrenched in democracy as we all feel these days. It's still a fragile transition. It's only been two and a half years. And that is why a lot of our international partners are commending us every day for the progress that we're making in ensuring stability. That is why the UN Secretary General has included Gambia in his sustaining peace agenda. So let's not assume that everything is rosy and dandy here. It's not. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Transitions take time, especially political transitions. So I um, thought in the, in the interest of um, public stability, I requested the police to review the evidence that they have, which led them to arrest the 37, and to narrow down on those who are um, directly responsible for the arson, um, for the burning down of Gogin Boop's house, and also the burning down of a police vehicle. Um, I asked them to zero in on those, and they came back with the report that, okay, they think these seven, um, are, um, on the basis of the evidence that they have as at that time, this was last week before we traveled to Qatar, that these seven um, are the ones that they have identified. So I took the decision to discontinue proceedings against the other 30. Um, of course, the charges included um, rioting, unlawful assembly. But like I said, um, it, was, it would not be in the public interest um, to prosecute 30 youths at that time. But those who are um, remanded in custody, we actually didn't oppose bail when their lawyers applied for bail. We had to revise and amend the charges because what they were charged with arson is not bailable. So we had to revise the charges to bring it to a lesser serious offense so that they can be granted bail while the police continue their investigations. We can't also allow people to burn down people's houses and properties and then walk away. That's not right. That's not how a country is governed. Otherwise, we will all be victims, each of us. And that is why we are taking a very strong position on the um, arson um, offense. But for the time being, um, I want the police to focus on those who are directly responsible. I've asked them to um, um, review the seven, the case of the seven as well, going forward. And hopefully I will hear back from the police. Um, it may or may not um, go down further. I don't know. But this is what the police have given to us. Uh, like I said, we have not yet even received the file officially from the police but um, to show the proactive nature of the government as a whole. Because let's not forget that the Justice Ministry is an integral part of government, ministry, I mean, of government machinery. So is the police. There are different parts, and we all do our parts. We all complement one another, and there are checks and balances, and that's how systems work. So if the police do not get it right all the time, we try to provide them with assistance that can fill in the gaps. If we don't get it right, the judiciary is here to provide an additional check. This is how systems work. So that's all I can say about that. Um, just to follow up, um, will it be fair to say that the public is concerned that the focus is on the burning of properties and not so much on the killers of Keba Seka and the um, murder of, uh, alleged torture of um, Usman Dabo? Is that the focus of the government or is some, that something your ministry can help to reorient it? Because life, we believe, should come before property and um, whether your ministry and the rest of the government, they believe in this. Let us be fair to this government. The police did a brilliant job um, following the murder of Keba Seka. Let us admit, they arrested the culprit, who was a police officer, and that culprit is in detention. Now, you can't say that the police have prioritized the burning over that incident because the culprit, the alleged suspect in the murder of Keba Seka, a police officer, for that matter, is in custody, and the police acted very swiftly. Now, in terms of the alleged torture of Usman Dabo, I think the um, report, recent report, um, the autopsy report was released, and I am not very sure because I was away when that happened, but I think the government has shared that report with the public to establish the cause of death. And so, um, this is why fake news is dangerous, because when we speak fake, no, it's true. Just last December, I think I was chatting with Honorable Minister, BBC yeah. had a documentary, Beyond Fake News. I'm not sure how many of you saw it. Yeah. The dangers that it causes yeah. in, in, in society. And, and, and in, the, in the particular case of um, Dabo, uh, the rumors unfortunately did not help. And some people you know, reacted spontaneously on the basis of those unfounded rumors and caused further damage and destruction in this country. So um, these are all challenges 
in an emerging democracy. Um, as I said, we will try to prevent where we fail. Uh, we will try to remedy when there are excesses. But we can't say that the police prioritize the burning um, of Gogin Boob's house over the investigations into the deaths of Keba Seka or Dabo. Thank you. Uh, I think one. Yeah, I just want one final question. Well, then, then he has to come because he never. You are the final, you know. Yes, and then the minister will make a statement. And, and uh, the, I mean, yes. I'm sorry. Honourable well, Minister, with all due respect, I know how you feel uh, when your mother is mentioned on this issue. I mean, given to the plight of your mother. But I said, Minister of Justice giving legal advice to the government. Would you now consider giving preference to other people who are not ministers and their mothers are in that situation? for government to give them a diplomatic passport? You know, right from the start, I said, I joke, that this is the only, when I travel outside this country, that's when I feel that I'm a minister. Now, you can't put ministers in the same box as everybody else. Every morning, you wake up, every morning, you wake up, you go about your personal business, right? You go about your personal business, your livelihood, your work. Every morning, ministers wake up and public servants, they go about the public's business. They leave aside their personal issues. They do work for you, for the public. And that is why they are recognized in some of the non-monetary privileges that ministers are given. That is why you're treated as a VIP when you go to certain places. Not everyone is given because we carry the public burden. And so um, if... The law allows for a minister to um, access certain privileges and their families. Well, complain to the law. Don't complain to me. I am not uh, the maker of the law. I am not the enforcer. So I'm only the enforcer. And so to ask that if the same could be extended to others, well, maybe, this, maybe every other citizen should be given a car, should be given an oddly, um, you know, treated the same way as every minister. And then maybe ministers should not be blamed when they leave... Um, public work and go and start to run after their own personal issues, just like you do, just like all private citizens do. That's the difference. That's the difference. My colleague question is whether now you will consider... Oh, I will certainly, I will return these passports, not because they were acquired unlawfully or wrongly. It's because I don't need the destruction. I don't need the destruction. My family doesn't need the destruction. And um, it has served its purpose. And just to... Re re I'm way to wait the point. A week and a half after they came back from Haiti, they submitted their request for U.S. visas. Go and find out from the American embassy whether they use the diplomatic passports. They use their ordinary passports. Just to underscore the point that really, I mean, it's much ado about nothing. Um, cabinet ministers, in fact, anyone who serves in public office demands some latitude, some respect for the office, not the persons. You can hate the person, that's okay, but it's the office that you have to look at. And we can't all be treated the same way. I mean, I'm not a communist. I don't pretend to be one. I don't want to be one. I'm a capitalist, born and bred. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, that uh, 